History is filled with remarkable tales of courage, resistance and resilience. And if there's one thing I've learned from my research so far, it's that heroes and heroines are born everywhere. You don't have to be a white man to do great things. To be remembered as a hero, unfortunately, often you do. But it is much more impressive when people become heroes who you would not expect, who challenge our stereotypical notion of what a hero is. It may therefore happen that when the young strongman remain silent in the face of imminent danger, an old woman becomes the heroine of an entire nation. Today's video is dedicated to this heroine, Nana Ya Asantewa, who at the age of 60 becomes a commander to fight against the oppression of her people by the British. Against the backdrop of colonial encroachment, her iron-willed spirit sparked an uprising that would forever echo in the annals of African history. And that represented the dramatic finale of the Ashanti Empire's 100 years struggle against the European invaders, the War of the Golden Stool. To European ears, it probably sounds strange at first, War of the Golden Stool. But before some people get cocky, remember that the British fought wars because a flagpole was cut down or a captain's ear was cut off or a pig was shot. But above all, we need to remember that the Golden Stool was not just some random stool over which war was fought. To understand the stakes of this epic confrontation, we must first appreciate the significance of the Golden Stool and the Ashanti Empire. The Ashanti Kingdom was founded in the late 17th century by Osoi Tutu and the priest Okomfo Anukye in what is now Ghana. In the founding myth of the empire, the golden stool already plays an important role because it was sent to the Ashanti by the supreme god. It contains the spirit and soul of the Ashanti people, or what the Asante people call Sundsum, making it an irreplaceable emblem of sovereignty and spirit. The stool thus serves as a symbol of Asante unity and is a priceless spiritual sanctuary, so sacred that it is not allowed to touch the ground, for example, and no one is allowed allowed to sit on it, not even the king. In terms of its holiness, the golden stool can perhaps best be compared to the holy grail. So, considering this role the golden stool had in the Ashanti Empire, the war was not just the war for a stool, but the war for the soul, unity and future of the Ashanti Empire. The Asante were a strong people whose unity and strength was attributed to the symbolic power of the stool. For a long time, the Asante were able to stand united against the European invaders who were interested in the riches of the region, which were cocoa, slaves and gold. In 19th century, the British fought against Ashanti resistance in no less than six wars, the last five being the largest and would become known as the Anglo-Ashanti Wars. So much war, terror and suffering was brought upon the empire by the British, but for almost a hundred years the Ashanti were able to resist British overpower. At some point, the brave Asante could no longer stand up to the British, who were becoming increasingly aggressive in the scramble for Africa. And so the Ashanti Empire was integrated into the British Gold Coast colony in 1901. The War of the Golden Stool was the last of these wars against the British Empire, which took place in 1900 and was to make Ya Asantewa a legend, which is why the war sometimes is also called the Ya Asantewa War of Independence. So Ya Asantewa was born around 1832 or 1840 in the Echizu region. During the same period, something unusual happened in the area. Many women suffered stillbirth of twins, including one woman from the royal family. One of her two children was a formless body. When the parents asked the oracle about its meaning, the oracle told them that this unique body was a deity called Atiku. This deity would guide the Asante in their wars in the future. A shrine was dedicated to Atiku and Ya Asantewa was to draw her spiritual strength from this shrine of Atiku. So it is possible that Atiku gave Ya Asantewa the strength she later needed to fight the British. For most of her life, Ya Asantewa was not a warrior but a farmer and a passionate one at that. She owned land which she farmed herself. She was very proud of this and advocated throughout her life that every woman should have her own property in order to remain independent of men. She said to the woman, Men are not pillows for any woman to lean against. The first 37 years of her life are actually quite unspectacular. She married a man from Kumasi, this is the Asante capital. They had a traditional polygamous marriage, with the husband having several wives. Ya Asantewa had one daughter, and besides her, she also took care of the children of the other wives. Her daughter, in turn, had a whole 11 children, one of whom later became king of the Echizu. And then it gets interesting. Ya Asantewa became queen mother around 1869, although it should actually be called queen grandmother. In this position, she assisted her grandson in an advisory role. She was known and loved for her honesty, helpfulness and diligence. In 1873, the Third Great War against the British broke out. And unlike the wars before, the British now defeated the Ashanti and kept 
captured the capital Kumasi, with British troops destroying much of the city, including the royal palace and its library of books from all over the world in a variety of languages. So much knowledge that was simply demolished. The Ashanti signed the Treaty of Fumena, which stated that they had to pay 50,000 ounces of gold to Her Royal Majesty the Queen. This was an impossible demand to meet and probably the British knew that. The British tightened the grip on the Ashanti Empire and so they made the Ashanti an offer to become a British protectorate. The reigning Ashanti King Premper I refused to surrender his sovereignty, but he wanted to spare his kingdom from another war, so he offered the British gold, rubber, cocoa and even himself as a ransom. But the British war machine was already running high and troops were by then on their way to the Ashanti Empire. So the British had already made their minds up and war was inevitable. So this was the beginning of the fourth great conflict. In fact, hardly any people died in this war, as the Ashanti King Prempe urged his people not to fight to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, instead handing himself over to the British. He signed a treaty in which the British again demanded their 50,000 ounces of gold from the previous war. Prempe could not or would not pay this and so he was exiled to the Seychelles along with other members of the royal family. Now, Ya Asantewa, as queen mother, assumes the role of king in Ichisu as well. From then on, the Ashanti Empire is under British protectorate and its treasures are open to the invaders. That should be enough for the British, one might think, but no, there always has to be more, more, more. In March 1900, Sir Frederick Hodgson, the then governor of the Gold Coast, called a meeting of the chiefs in Kumasi to find out where it was, the symbol of Ashanti power, the golden stool. The British colonial forces, unaware of its cultural depth, sought to commandeer the stool as a symbol of their dominion. Hodgson, the moron, now gives perhaps the most stupid and ignorant speech ever given by a human being. What must I do to the man, whoever he is, who failed to give to the Queen, who is the paramount power in the country, the stool to which she was entitled? Where is the golden stool? Why am I not sitting on the golden stool at this moment? I am the representative of the paramount power. Why have you relegated me to this chair? Why did you not take the opportunity of my coming to Kumasi to bring the golden stool and give it to me to sit upon? However, you may be quite sure that although the governor has not received the golden stool, it will rule over you with the same impartiality and the same firmness as if you had produced it. It would almost be funny if it wasn't so bad. So Sir Peabrain, who hasn't understood the meaning of the golden stool at all, goes after the chiefs with the finest of a steamroller. In fact, none of the people present knows where the stool actually is, because Prempe has hidden the stool and no one but him knows where it is. And that is exactly why the chiefs also tell Hodgson that he should bring Prempe back from exile so he can tell him where the stool actually is. Nanaya Santewa is his queen mother and king is also present. Already on arrival, she has made it clear to Hodgson's and his wife that she is not sympathetic to the invaders. She refuses to shake Hodgson's hand and when she shook Hodgson's wife's hand, she did so with a handful of spit and chewed cocoa leftovers. Now that Hodgson has voiced his demand for the stool, she counters him. Foolish white man, who are you to demand the golden stool? The golden stool is the property of the king of Ashanti and not for people like you. Do you belong to the royal family? Where is our king? Go and bring him to show you where the golden stool is kept. He is the sole custodian and he knows where it is hidden. She turns then to the chiefs and waits for a reaction, but they remain silent and hesitant, not wanting to upset the British. Ya Santewa now addresses them. Now I see that some of you fear to go forward to fight for our king. If it were in the brave old days of Osetutu, Okomfo, Nokia and Opokuwere, chiefs would not sit down to see their king to be taken away without firing a shot. No European could have dared speak to chiefs of Ashanti in the way the governor spoke to you. Is it true that the bravery of Ashanti is no more? I cannot believe it. It cannot be. I must say this. If you, the men of Ashanti, will not go forward, then we will. We, the women, will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white men. We will fight till the last of us falls in the battlefields. So Hodgins then interrupts and says he would also take gold and instead of the duel. And this is the last straw. Ya Santewa now shuts a rifle in the air and declares war. For the British, this was just another small war against a few rebellious savages. But for Ashanti, it was about everything. It was a fight for their identity, dignity and the right to govern their destiny. Now almost 60, Ya Asantewa becomes commander-in-chief of the Ashanti army. After assembling her fighters, Ya Asantewa gave another spirited speech to the warriors. 
Brave men of Ashanti, we are now faced with a serious confrontation by the governor's extremely provocative request for the golden stool, which is the religious symbol of unity of the Ashanti nation. Not quite long ago, the white man came and unilaterally occupied our God-given land and by force of arms has declared Ashanti Kingdom a British protectorate. We should also not forget that during the reign of King Karikari, the aggressors waged a senseless war on us, destroyed the seat of the Ashanti monarch and burnt our palace after looting all the treasures because bequeathed to us by our forefather. Taking our brave men for a ride, the governor arbitrarily arrested and deported our king together with some prominent chiefs of Ashanti, without you men raising a finger. Today, he has come again to demand the golden stool. Gallant youth and men of our fatherland, shall we sit down to be dehumanized all the time by these rogues? We should rise and defend our heritage. It is better to perish than to look on sheepishly while the white man whose sole business in our country is to steal, kill and destroy threatens to rob us of our golden stool. Arise men and defend the golden stool from being captured by foreigners. It is more honorable to perish in defense of the golden stool than to remain in perpetual slavery. I am prepared and ready to lead you to war against the white man. Ya Santiwa mobilizes the standing army of the Ashanti. Soldiers and weapons are procured from everywhere. They fashioned any object available, machete, chopping knives, axes, bright sticks, bottles, plantain, bamboo, ropes and swamps into weaponry. Ya Santiwa knows very well that the Ashanti are outgunned by the British and that is why she asks the deity Atiko for spiritual support. Ya Santiwa, unlike modern day presidents who do not go to the battlefield, was at the center of the war in all areas of planning and execution. The Ashanti rely on guerrilla tactics against the British overwhelming force and so they lay siege to the British fort for months. This is where Ya Santiwa uses starvation as a strategy. Moreover, they used deception tactics and movement detractors against their enemies and these worked perfectly in dissuading the British. In fact, the Ashanti also used psychological warfare by beating the so-called death drums. The fear the people in the fort felt hearing these death drums was said to be so frightening it was worse than death itself. With these strategies, Among others, Ya Santewa and her Ashanti army were able to stand against the powerful Britain for over a month with their entire sophisticated armory. The also powerful British soon could no more, and so Sir Hodgson asked the Ashanti to negotiate an agreement for armistice. The conditions of the Ashantis were that their king will be released and sent back to them, that the indemnity which the governor was demanding will be cancelled, and that the governor would not force them to bring the golden stool. I mean, they didn't know where it was anyway. Governor Hodgson agreed to the terms. But if there's one thing we have learned from all of these conflicts, it is this. Never trust the invaders. And so, of course, Governor Hodgson broke his word. The British killed the Ashanti chief who was leading the negotiations in the fort. And Hodgson sent his soldiers into the villages around Kumasi to burn them down. Understandably infuriated by these insensitive moves of the governor, the Ashantis led then to the resumption of the war. As the war intensified, the super brave governor fled the theater of war to Cape Coast before the Ashanti could capture him. From here, he now sends reinforcements to fight the Ashanti. The British take Ya Asantewa's only daughter and her grandchildren children as captives. And so the commander Ya Santewa decides to give up. On the 3rd March 1901, she's taken prisoner. Her arrest breaks the fighting spirit of the Ashanti and so the British triumph with the Ashanti Empire becoming a colony by conquest. Ya Santewa is sent to join the other exiles in the Seychelles where she dies in 1921 at the age of around 81. In 1924, the exiled Ashanti, including the king, Prempa I, are allowed to return to the Ashanti Empire. They bring Ya Asantewa's bones with them so that she can find her final resting place in her homeland. Even though the British write of a victory against the Ashanti in the history books, the Ashanti see things differently because the reason for the war, the golden stool, despite everything, did not fall into the hands of the British, although they supposedly searched the whole country for it. But stool was not lost. He was accidentally found by workers deep in the forests of the kingdom. Today, only the core of the royal family knows the location of the golden stool. Ya Santewa was aware of the importance of the stool for her people. It is the unifying force, the spirit and soul of the people. And so it is thanks to her that the Ashanti still exists today. Though Ya Santewa was captured and exiled, her legacy far outlived her life. As a visionary and strategist, her courage inspired not only her contemporaries, but countless generations that followed. She demonstrated that one woman's voice can roar louder than the roar of cannon and one woman's spirit can move an entire nation. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, feel free to leave a like or subscribe to the channel.